Okay. Take a look. Okay, ad break. Weird. Heh. <laughs> Looking. Come on. You're saying on? Come on, really? Okay, hello. Hello everyone, can you hear? We're gonna do a mic check here. Check, check, one, two, check, check. Check, 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 check. How's the audio? Video, video quality. Been a long time since I was on since I was on Twitch. Been a very long time. Hello, CG Happy Mac. Hello, Amuse Sleuth. Hello. I'm trying to actually get a screen of how this actually looks like. And on Alright, alright, I can see myself. And I can see myself. Okay. This is good. Yeah, I can see myself, which is uh, okay, I see the mouse. Quality looks okay, I guess. Yeah. How long has it been? It's been April, well, May, there was nothing. June, there was nothing. July, August, four months. Yeah. Four months. Been a long four months. And a hot one as well. But let me just tell you, it looks good. Everything looks good so far. Everything looks good. I got the gift this uh, What is this thing? All right. Three minutes. I'm going to actually send a message on the, oh my God, the Twitterverse. On now. Shark, yeah. Okay, seat is good. How's everyone doing today? Got nine viewers. I think people are gonna tune in at um tune in in like five minutes. We're going to start right on the dot at, um, actually, yeah, five minutes. We're going to start right on the dot at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time. There will be, how many will there be? All right. Take a look. Okay, so I'm on Firefox. That looks good. Oh, brave. I should have be recently switched over to Firefox as my day-to-day -day driver. I'm still using Brave, but the one thing is I'm finding that there may be some issues behind the scenes where, behind the browser, where um, it seems like DNS requests are, like, really, really laggy requests. So when you try to go to, like, Type in reddit.com, you hit the enter key, it, you take like a, a minute or something. It's like weird. So that's the schedule. So we got, what, 13? Yep, we got 13 episodes coming up. Yeah, Freedom Fighter just stop at. How are you? How are you? Freedom Fighter, hello, hello. Always a pleasure to see you. Always a pleasure to digitally see you. 
Um, I still have, you know, of course, I, you know, back in my memories, I look, I, I feel like, you know, I'm, um, I can still be envision, uh, still envision you. Uh, you get what I'm trying to say. Um, always a pleasure. So one of the things that I don't think a lot of people really know uh, about disease twitch dreams is um, it's not only just current students enrolled in my security class, but the general public and also uh, former former students, alums. A lot of people come come back, say hello. Um, means a lot. Always, always means a lot for the alums uh, to say hello. Um, so Freedom Pfeiffer, I guess I can say this a little bit. Um, yeah, uh, the market for retro video games. That's just something these days. I'm actually not sure. You know, one thing is, is that I have a Nintendo Switch. I absolutely would love to stream stuff on my Nintendo Switch off of it. But the problem is, it's a Switch Lite. Yeah. Hello, Ga uh, Garrett, uh, Garrett K1. Kevin Wu, hello, hello everyone. Hello. Yeah. Cool. This is one of my favorite topics, forgive. Um, it's all hands on. You know, one of the things I really, really, uh, I'll say this, I think I said this a few times last year. Hello, Mellow underscore dots. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you for joining. One of the things I really like about teaching on Twitch uh, live to the general public, uh, I'll say this now, is that teaching feels like a lot less of a thankless job because, you know, people who tune in, they really, really want the information. Um, and right now, there's just a lot of people who uh, want to learn cybersecurity, um, not only because it's a growing important field it's becoming an international crisis but also there's a lot of people i i am aware of um there's a lot of people who you know have been in the technology business and like development for so long and it's like you know this programming thing is it's nice but i want to take my skills to the next level because you know sometimes you know anyone can learn programming Anyone can learn programming. One of the nice things about cybersecurity is, despite the fact it is such a very broad field, you really, really get a holistic view of technology. Not only tech itself, but also um, non-technical matters and like how technology and issues uh, apply to things like politics, international relations, psychology, the list goes on. Uh, I, yeah, about the job scam, about the, uh, about the retro scam, yeah, a Freedom Fighter sent it to me. Freedom Fighter sent that to me, and I'm like, I guess I'm not surprised, because, like, it was like, everything is going on, like, everything is just a mess right now. We got one minute left. I want to thank you all. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining in today. Um, this is day one, season three, season three of Twitch. Uh, I'm happy to be back. Um, very, very happy to be back. Um, didn't know that there are prime subs here. I don't know how I set that up, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's one of the things like this is I, I wasn't sure if I was going to do this at the end of last spring because, okay, you know, we're going into, we're, we're, you know, the whole academic year, 2020, 2021. I mean, we're in a pandemic, so everything was virtual. Um, Everything was virtual, but now, you know, here we are, and I've invested so much time in not only streaming, but also in terms of the audience here, you, that it's hard, it feels hard to give up, and we're not out of the, uh, out of the woods yet, and we also need to understand that, uh, we also got to know that, you know, virtual learning, this isn't going to go away, this isn't going to go away, um, I'm so behind on the hype train, but here we are. I mean, we're at the, now we're one minute late, but it's okay. Welcome everyone. Um, season three, 
We're back on the air on Twitch. Welcome, Introduction to Cybersecurity. I'm Ming Chao, I'm Associate Teaching Professor at Tufts University. Um, well, really, really nice to be back. And this is the third season for me doing these uh, cybersecurity tutorials and trainings. And it's something I really, really enjoy. And I also want to, you know, it also means a lot that everyone is tuning in, um, is, uh, is tuning in. And I miss you all. Uh, miss you all. But it's very customary for those, um, very customary for the very first session uh, on Twitch. Uh, if you are new to cybersecurity, welcome. If you are new, not only in terms of a student at Tufts in the um, My Security class, but also if you're trying to learn cybersecurity, welcome. Welcome. Um, you're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to have a lot of fun. And everything's going to be hands-on as well, too. And everything's going to be uh, uh, nice and hands-on. Um, you're not going to... Maybe maybe the last session, I may ramble. But we're going to um, do a lot of hands-on training. Today, we're going to talk... Uh, we're gonna, you know, today's uh, session is on packet analysis using Wireshark. So I've left behind my other work email address. Um, this is a tutorial and training I not only love to give, but I've given it, I give it this all the time. And I want to start off by a brief history of how this training came about. And I guess also why we give this training, uh, why we give this training all the time. Um, that is my other work email address that I left here. But you also notice something very peculiar. It doesn't say that Tufts University saves the wall of sheep in the packet hacking building. Yes, I am I'm, uh, a member of the wall of sheep and the packet hacking village team. Um, I'm one of the leads who actually helped set up the packet hacking village at DEF CON. Uh, those are the Twitter handles at wallofsheep.com and at uh, mchow01. Uh, I don't have an Adidas sponsorship. I, 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 okay, I'm not going to get into that, but I certainly don't have, I mean, I don't got a, an Adidas sponsorship. <laughs> I'm, no. <laughs> thanks anyway. Thanks for the compliment. Uh, but you may be wondering, okay, whoa, 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 whoa. What is this wall of sheep thing? What is this packet hacking village thing? And what in the world is a packet? Let's get to that right away. Let's get to that right away. So a little brief, um, a little brief history uh, about how I got to learn all the hands-on skills that I have now in cybersecurity. Um, like everyone else, you know, we all started, we all start somewhere, and it's probably not in the classroom. Uh, it's probably by way of virtual, like learning on your own or good friends and good people. And that's actually how I got started with um, how I got all the cybersecurity uh, and networking hands-on knowledge. I got it from a place called um, the Wall of Sheep at uh, DEF CON. DEF CON is the infamous cybersecurity uh, hacking conference that is held in Las Vegas each and every summer. It's also the conference that, you know, parents tell their kids never to go to um, for all the wrong reasons. But um, my first time at DEF CON was in 2006. Um, 15 years ago, hard to think about it. And I remember I bumped into this this place called the Wall of Sheep at, at DEF CON. I was like, what in the world is this? And the Wall of Sheep in a packet hacking village at the DEF CON cybersecurity, uh, DEF CON hacking slash security conferences, their goal is to do security awareness. Um, and our, actually, our goal is security uh, awareness. And we accomplished that mission by way of a lot of unconventional means, including interactive demonstrations, training, special events. Uh, one of my favorites was back in like 2010, we had a peekaboo booth, um, pay 25 cents to a booth, and you actually take a look at all the traffic on the DEF CON uh, conference network. Um, there were a lot of, let's say, um, rated NC-17 material, uh, but all the money went to the EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which was really cool. Our team was all volunteer. We pay for ourselves to get to, to DEF CON in, in, in Vegas each and every summer. Uh, I didn't go last year, uh, this past summer. A lot of people did. Um, it was both virtual uh, hybrid. It was uh, a hybrid conference. Um, really miss going back and meeting all the, you know, all the teammates. 
But if you ever gone to DEF CON, if you ever, ever go to DEF CON, one of the most telling, like, glaring, glaring things that you will see at DEF CON is this thing called the Wall of Sheep. So what is this thing? So the Wall of Sheep at DEF CON is a wall that has all the usernames and passwords um, that were sent insecurely, that were sent insecurely over the DEF CON network. Now, the DEF CON network is arguably one of the most dangerous networks in the world because who goes to DEF CON? You have um, cybersecurity professionals, both good and bad. You, um, hey, Sam, what's going on? Oh, my, welcome, dude, thank you for saying, uh, Professor Sam Bone, Professor Sam Bone uh, has joined, and welcome, hello, thank you so much, uh, Sam is also now, uh, he's also a member of uh, the Wall of Sheep uh, and the Packet Hacking Village as well, now gives training at DEF CON, how are you, great to see you um, virtually, we work together quite a bit, and uh, Sam, actually, I would also give a shout out. If you want real nice, real good hands-on cybersecurity uh, training and material, Sam offers, uh, I'll just I tell you straight up that he does a better job than I am. I mean, his stuff, just go to Sam. What, what's your website? Can you put, what's your website? Is it sambone.com? But I know is it, it used to be at um, CCSF. Feel free, put it on the chat. Um, you know, sometimes I use your material as well. Ah, oh, man. Uh, you got the sensor. But going back, the wall of sheep um, at, that, let me go back. So you have cybersecurity professionals, good and bad, that goes to DEF CON. But you also have law enforcement, you have criminals, you have lawyers, you have government officials, uh, including um, people from three-letter agencies. So you have uh, journalists that go on the network, and it can be a very, very dangerous place. It's a, it's a battlefield. And what the Wall of Sheep is, what we do is we find all the usernames and passwords uh, sent on the DEF CON network insecurely in plain text. And the reason we do this is it looks like a wall of shame, but what it is is it's an education opportunity for people to say, if we found that you are sending your username and password on arguably the world's most dangerous uh, uh, computer network, you really, this is why you need to use encrypted or more secure services like HTTPS or SSH, okay? Um, it's an education opportunity. And what I'm going to today, also going to show you like how, you know, the tricks of the trade, what we use um, to reveal, to find username and password that are sent in plain text readable text, human readable text over like an insecure network. Okay, so one of the, the, the key word of this present, uh, of this, the key word uh, of the presentation title is the idea of a packet. So what is, what is a packet? And what is packet analysis? I'll start with the idea, I'll start off with what is packet analysis. Packet analysis is looking at, and it's just looking at and understanding traffic that is on a computer network. Packet analysis goes by so many different names, such as analyzing packets, network traffic analysis, packet sniffing, protocol analysis, packet tracing. They're all the same thing. But for all intent purposes, I'm going to stay consistent today, and we're going to call this packet analysis. Okay? It's really just take a look at what, uh, what's, uh, what's on a computer network. Take a look at all the, comp of all the traffic on a computer network, whether that is a large area network, like at a corporation or at a major conference uh, or your tele telecommunication provider or even the traffic at your home, like uh, uh, and in your home when you have like one, one router, like all the devices that are connected on your home network. Why? What's the point of packet, ana uh, packet analysis? Now, here's the thing, um, and this is my first time I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this a lot uh, for the next so many weeks. A lot of Tools and techniques in cybersecurity can be used for good and bad. I repeat, cyber, a lot of the tools and techniques uh, in cybersecurity can be used for both good and bad. Um, it's a double-edged sword. So packet analysis will help you troubleshoot networking, uh, networking issues. Let me give you an example. It's like, okay, why isn't the uh, PlayStation or the Xbox uh, uh, connecting to... Uh, 
their online respective online services. Um, you can also uh, record and analyze uh, web traffic under the hood. So I know a lot of websites now you're not even allowed to don uh, to download pictures and other content. Well, with packet analysis, where if you actually record the, the, the network traffic, you can actually recover and download those files that you quote unquote can't download on the web. Uh, you know, you can reconstruct images, data, and other uh, on the network, such as email, voice, chat. Uh, and you can also catch information, such as username and password, that were sent insecurely in plain text. This is bad in the year 2021. Because if you're, if you're transmitting in, like real sensitive information, such as credit card numbers, and it can be intercepted by prying eyes, or if someone is monitoring the computer net, uh, 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 your computer network, that is not good at all. So one of my fun stories and claim to fame is I think more than a couple of years ago, I like to joke that we started World War III, and this was an article in Wired magazine about the the Mirai botnet that that brought down the internet. It was written by Garrett Graff, and Garrett's a great guy. We had a conversation about this. But it was, there was this paragraph that was really weirdly worded on Wired, which is on compromised devices, they had to carefully reconstruct the network traffic data and study that Mirai code launched so-called packets against its targets, a little understood forensics pa process known as analyzing PCAP, packet capture data. Think of this as the digital equivalent of testing for fingerprints or gunshot residue. It was the most complex, the most complex DDoS software I've ever run across. Um, you know, and this was a weird, weird wording of this. This was not. This was within the last couple of years, uh, and you know, it also made me think. It's like, is this really? Has this really been a lost skill um, over the years? Because it's an inside joke in cybersecurity. Packets or it didn't happen, um, but. Really what today is and the motivation is today. I'm actually going to teach you. I'm going to show you this little understood forensics pack uh, Forensics process. I want to give a shout out to Garrett Graff for writing this um, Yeah, I like to rag on you a bit, but it's always a nice talking point when I do this tutorial So what is a packet? Okay, what is a packet a single packet or network packet is a unit of data Anytime you do anything on the computer over the computer network, whether it is streaming a, a, a streaming a video on Netflix, whether you're playing a video, whether you're downloading a web page, whether you're receiving email, whether you're trying to print uh, from your uh, laptop to the uh, printer down the hallway, um, all that traffic over a computer network is a data stream. It is comprised of many many packets. So, if you're if you're playing, uh, uh, let's say Modern Warfare um, uh, online, uh, you, there will be many, many. I can't even give a nice count. I mean, we're talking hundreds, if not even thousands, of packets between your console, your video game console, and the network all the time. Uh, when you download a web page, I mean, that could be dozens and dozens of packets. Never one. So when you're streaming a video on you on uh, YouTube or on Netflix, I mean we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of packets uh, per per minute or per second. It's a lot. So in general, what a single network packet contains is cont will contain the following information: source and destination IP address and ports, MAC addresses, time to live, the protocol, uh, payload, the data, or the piece of data. Uh, to construct a whole web page or a picture the list goes on okay so whatever you do on a network on a computer network is made up of many many packets okay a single network packet a single network packet encapsulates 
um, all uh, layers of the open systems interconnection model, also known as the OSI model. And Nashi Shu, what happens? Okay, ah, okay, 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 okay. This is a great question. Thank you for asking. This is a good question. What happens to the stream if one or more of these packets do not reach its destination? That is possible. It happens all the time. It depends on the protocol. It depends on the protocol that you're using. But uh, often or not, believe it or not, when you stream a video on uh, Netflix or on YouTube, uh, it there is a very possibility that sometimes the packet does not reach uh, its destination. The stream happens, but it may look choppy. And the protocol, interestingly enough, that you ask this question, Many streaming services that you use a stream like to play live TV uh, over the internet is a uh, user called UDP. There's no handshaking, it's just throwing a whole bunch of packets to you because it has to be as fast as possible. Because, you know, streaming video got to be really fast, like streaming stuff got to be really fast. And if it doesn't reach the final destination, okay, too bad. I mean, it just gets, uh, we don't care, the life, uh, everything keeps on going on. But the quality may be like potato quality. Uh, time to live uh, seem to imply that the data is self-destruct after a lot of time. Yep. Uh-huh. Packet is IP layer. It should not uh, be all about layer. TCP is a layer. It's called a segment. Yep. The UDP is a uh, called a datagram and data link is called a frame. Okay. Uh, what is handshaking? The whole idea of handshaking is especially if you're using TCP, which is a by and large, a majority of uh, the communication on a computer network, the TCP means TCP IP builds a um, reliable connection between two computers. And handshaking, and in order to do that, a handshaking process has to happen first. So, oblivion, okay? It has to be a negotiation process, which goes sync, sync act, and act. And then once that communication, once that handshake happens, then data can go back and forth between the two parties reliably. So here's, here is the OSI model. So what the OSI model is, what you really just got to know is this. It's a conceptual framework that describes uh, the functions of networking and telecommunication systems. The most important thing is, the most important number is seven layers. Each layer is abstracted from each other. Each layer has a certain responsibility. Layer seven at the very top is the highest level of abstraction, which you and I, like these are like, like the software and application that you and I know and love and use every day, such as things like the web, uh, email, um, remote file access, printer access, network man management, directory services. That's the stuff we care about and we use every day. And then layer six is a presentation layer. Um, this is for things like syntax, uh, data encryption, compression. Layer five is session session management uh, for things like um, you know perform security name recognition. Okay, six is not no SSH is seven. No, SSH, if, if it's like, if you're mentioning tools and stuff that you use and know every day, that's layer seven. It's application layer. So SSH will definitely be in layer seven. But it's funny that so now the whole point of the OSI model is you only care about the application layer, but underneath the hood, you don't care about, you, the user, don't care about. Um, but underneath the hood is how networking really works. Transport, the real layers that we care about are the one that we're going to focus a lot on are four and three. I'm going to start with layer three, the network layer. The network layer, um, famous for things like, maintains things like the IP address, source and destination address. Okay. Layer four is the transport layer for the transmission control protocol. This will actually have things like guaranteed reliability of delivery of data from point A to point B, um, flags, and also things like your, your payload for your content that you're downloading or uploading. So the transport layer reliability, uh, okay, 
So you can't just send, you can't just use the network layer for sending data. The network layer, the only thing that it has are things like the IP, like IP address, source and destination. But the message, the actual message for that is being sent, a pieces of that will be in the transport layer. Layers three and four work together. Layer two data link is things like the MAC address, okay? Layer one at the lowest, lowest, lowest level of them all, the physical layer. These are things like the cable, the hubs, the switches, okay, the, like the hardware, um, ethernet card, your, your wireless card, okay? So one of the common things that, uh, a common analogy to understand the LSI model is, um, ah, which layer does the handshake? If I am not mistaken, the handshake layer, handshake is usually done, I, we're going to see that later. We're going to see that. Um, handshake is, you will see that in layer four, transport. We're actually going to do a, an exercise on that, okay? Yeah, it kind of depends on the protocol because uh, there's some protocols that don't do handshaking, like uh, UDP. UDP is layer four, where, but is, there's no handshaking involved as well. It's a good tricky question. Um, so I think of like things like when you're mailing a package to the United States Postal Service. You're mailing something to the United States Postal Service. The only thing you care about is putting the envelope, uh, you know, writing your letter, putting in the envelope, put the to and from address uh, and a stamp on it and just dump it in the mailbox. But underneath the hood, like the things like the mail trucks, the airplane, the sorting facility, you don't care about. Think of that as the analogy for the OSI model. Now, another good example, one of the best pictures I like to see, I like, I like to show everyone on like how the OSI model really, really works in action is this picture. It's, from, it's a Reddit meme. So let's say you're actually trying to send a message from one user to the end user, to one, from one user, from one person to another down, let's say a classroom. So you have a Reddit user at the top that's trying to pass a message to another person. So it goes to the application layer, then it goes to the transport layer, then it goes to the internet layer, the internet layer, to the link layer, but now then the link layer to the physical layer, and then it goes back up again to that person. That goes link layer, the internet layer, the transport layer, the application layer, and then the, finally the person received the message, you fool. Okay. Um, yep, thank you so much, uh, MT, -tag, MT Tagger. Thank you so much. Okay. So whenever you actually do anything over a network, it will go through each and every layer. There's also a running joke that no one really cares about layers five and six. You know, it's one of those things where the OSI model, like, oh, uh, goes off the rails. Okay. So, but the important thing is, the important thing that you got out of the last few minutes is the OSI model, you know, seven layers, each layer all abstracted from each other, have a different job. You may be wondering why is that OSI model important? Well, I'll get to that in a few seconds. So, what is a PCAP file? A, it's actually a file, a computer file. A PCAP stands for packet capture. Dot PCAPs is a file extension. It's a common file extension for packet captures and is commonly used, which is commonly used for many applications and tools such as like Wireshark. Then highlighted, we'll get to what Wireshark is. So it's a file that contains many, many packets. A PCAP file contains many, many packets. Just to give you an idea, a 100 megabyte PCAP file can contain tens of thousands of packets. Okay? So yeah, a PCAP file, what a PCAP file is, is just many, many network packets in binary. And then you can use it, you can open it up in Wireshark analysis. So what is this thing called Wireshark? Ah, Wireshark. Yeah, the five layers of the OSI model show is a simplified version of previous slide. Yep, it is. It is. And also, we don't care about layers five and six again. I didn't say that. You can talk to Rob Graham about that as well. So what's Wireshark? A Wireshark is a graphical tool, uh, an extensive packet analyzer. What does that mean? Yeah, it can analyze packets. 
and pcap files and open up pcap files. Wireshark is free and open source, platform independent, and it contains so many powerful tech tools and techniques such as filtering, reconstruct conversations, reconstructing files based on packets. Download it and go to wireshark.org. And historically speaking, um, it is arguably the most important tool for um, network, uh, anyone that's working on networks or in, like network, computer networking. Uh, Wireshark is also has been historically always been one of the top tool uh, cybersecurity tools that you got to know. And Wireshark is uh, one of the tools that we use um, at the Wall of Sheep and for training purposes. It's like the tool. So here's the Wireshark interface. There's our main toolbar, packet pane list, packet details, and packet bytes. Okay. It doesn't make any sense unless we do a real exercise. So why don't we do this? I'm going to copy a link. Is there a graphical version? Is this a graphical version of T-Shark? Yes, it is. It is. T-Shark is, is command line only. Wireshark is a graphical version of Wireshark. They actually, if you install Wireshark, you, you get T-Shark. You will install uh, T-Shark as well. So let's do uh, an exercise. Okay, so I just posted a link on the stream manager on Twitch. Okay, so I'm just going to go, I'm going to click on this, copy the link. Well, and here's a funny brave. And I'm going to save set one to my desktop. Okay, so set one dot pcap. What this is, uh, this is a very small tutorial file, okay? Can you all see? You can all see, right? You can just see my desktop right now and me at the bottom left corner. What I'm going to do first, I am, what the first thing I'm going to do is, um, let's see how big this set1.pcap file is. 715 bytes, really small, 715 by, bytes or 4 kilobytes on disk. So I'm going to open up my terminal app on my terminal on my, I'm using Mac. So I'm going to go to my desktop. Okay. So you get got the presentation in PDF. And I have set one.pd, set one.pcap, which I just downloaded. What I want to show you first is let's take a look at how this file looks like on a command line, on the command line. Like how does it look underneath the hood? How does set one.pcap look on the terminal? And you can do this by like cat or more, it doesn't matter what you, or less, it doesn't matter what you use. I like cat because it's going to show you everything. Cat set one dot pcap. Now we'll notice what just happened. There you go. Hey, born to be wrong. Hey, you're a cybersecurity professional now. What are you doing back here? What are you doing here? Born to be wrong, uh, trustee, former student, and also pseudo TA for the course. Great to have you on the air again. Look at set one that PCAP underneath the hood. If I try to just look at this file on the terminal, does anyone notice? Ah, what does file set one that PCAP return? Let's do it. Now here's the problem. As you can, if we just take a look at the content of set one that PCAP, it's unreadable. It's highly unreadable. It's all in binary. That's it. This this whole content, all of this stuff, all this like all really good characters, these garbage, it's the content of set one dot pcap. That's it. That's all the content there is to it. The only thing you can see, oh yeah, I see what me worry. So you do file. Okay, what is the world? What's the file command? Man file. If you wanna okay, so what the file command does is determine file type. So if I do file set one dot pcap, it's gonna say set one dot pcap is a pcap capture file version two point four. Yeah, the link is up. Is 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 up. Uh, hold on, hold on. Let me post the link again. Yeah, that should work. That sucks. That links uh, get censored, which is weird. Anyway, so now you know that set. This is set one dot pcap. I'm gonna quit. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna exit it. I'm gonna exit this. I'm, I'll, I'll come back to this. Now, 
I'm going to open up Wireshark. You ready? Here we are. Hi, welcome to Wireshark. Welcome. Can you all see? This is Wireshark. Hello. Kind of overwhelming. It can be really, it's really overwhelming for people who just, uh, who, who, have, who have, no, have never done this before. But how it works is this. Now I'm in Wireshark, I'm going to open up that same set1.pcap file. File open, set1.pcap. 715 bytes. Welcome. There you go. So file cry, isn't it? You're not seeing binary this time. Wireshark was able to decipher set1.pcap. And here we are. There it is. So, welcome to Wireshark and packet analysis. This set1.pcap file. Now, a pcap file contains, I said, a pcap file contains many, many, many packets. Let's do the exercise here. Okay, open up set1.pcap. How many packets are there? Question number one. Question number two, what networking protocol is used? Question three, what is the source IP address? Number four, what is the destination IP address? Number five, what port number is used, uh, is the source used to communicate with the destination? Or what port number is the destination listening on? Let's answer the first question. How many packets are there? How many packets are there? This one is just count the number of rows. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's only eight packets in set one dot pcap. Uh, the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, the first number on the leftmost column is a sequential number. Yeah. So that's the answer for the first question. How many packets are there? Eight. What networking protocol is being used? What networking protocol that's being used? Well, let's take a look. So on the table here, on the table here, we have source IP address, destination IP address. You also see protocol. That's the protocol that's being used is TCP. TCP. Your links. You also have info. Information column gives a nice snapshot of what that packet looks like. All the information. Now, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Now, remember this slide I had earlier, the user interface? And I want to give you a little preview. I want to give you a little more breakdown, a nice interactive breakdown of how things, well, how it really works. The very top here, this is your toolbar. You can use the toolbar to do things like packet filtering, like a pa filter by IP address, um, filter by keyword. You can do a string search as well, too. Yeah. Now, I'm going to actually show you the fourth pane first, because the fourth pane is the packet. This is the raw, this fourth pane here, this fourth pane here, Zero zero uh zero 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 one zero 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 two zero 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 three zero 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 four zero. This is the um raw packet in binary de in binary. And you can see the hexadecimal equivalent as well. This is the raw packet, which is basically what um you saw in the terminal earlier on. Why I'm gonna bring I bring this up la uh, second because the most important ones are. The most important sections are the packet list pane and the packet detail pane. Now, remember this thing called the OSI model I talked about a little bit earlier? Yeah. Now, I'm going to actually I'm going to actually click through each and every different packet. I'm going to click through each and every packet. Notice when I click through each and every packet, The list pane not only changed, but most importantly, the details also change. The packet, the d d details also change. Let me click on the first packet again. Here we are. Here are all your layers. Except what's interesting is you click on packet number one. And you can actually do a drill down of all the different layers of the OSI model for that packet. For the first packet, you can see the transmission control protocol, TCP, layer four of the OSI model, source port and destination port. Oh, interesting. 
Yeah, I off the top of my head, good question. I always forget what ECN and ECW are. Uh, I always forget off the top of my head. So the TCP, the Transmission Control Protocol, the only uh, field that it will have that it maintains a source port, destination port, stream index, acknowledgement number, flags, sync, ENCI, CWI, I forget what those are, window, checksum, urgent pointer, timestamps. Yeah. TCP, Transmission Control Protocol, Layer 4 of the OSI model. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. TCP, Transmission Control Protocol, I only see source port, destination port, but where's the source and destination IP addresses? TCP is not responsible, does not handle IP address. That's the layer below, layer 3, the Internet Control Protocol, the Internet Protocol, IPv4. And guess what happened? You can hide this, expand. Internet Protocol version 4, source, destination, IP version 4, here are all the fields. But you also notice something was interesting. Each and every time I highlight a field on, uh, on a drill down, where that field, where that is on the raw packet gets highlighted. So IP, the uh, IP Internet Protocol version 4, you can see protocol TCP 06. That's in the packet, and you can actually see, when I enter that, I'm going to highlight it, you can see the 06 highlighted in the raw packet below. Ah, here we go, IP, uh, uh, Internet Protocol version 4, source IP, source address, destination, uh, destination address. So you can see when I actually highlight source and destination address, I'm flipping back and forth right now. I'm flipping back and forth right now, and you can see where on the raw packet it is, uh, that IP address is. Thank you, C2068. Okay. So, now you know where the uh, source and destination IP addresses are. It's always under the IP uh, internet protocol. Port numbers, flags, data, it's always in the transmission control protocol. So that's why now, therefore, it's commonly used as, commonly known as TCP IP. They work together. So you have a TCP IP, between transmission control protocol, internet protocol, they work together. You can also go see layer two stuff. Layer two, Ethernet two, you can see the MAC addresses. Destination MAC address, source MAC address. Using a MAC address, MAC addresses will be unique for each and every hardware, what Wireshark also does is pretty damn nice. It actually can also decipher what kind of a device it is. So you notice it seems like I'm clicked on I'm clicking on layer uh, packet number one right now. The source is an Apple device, and the destination is a Raspberry device, Raspberry Pi. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Good call. Yes, I agree with that guy. I agree. So yeah. Well played. So what's the source and destination IP? Now, this is a tricky thing. So question three and four. Well, in this case, it may seem really apparent that the source is 192.168.1.3 and the destination is 192.168.1.8. But what's it, but you can really, really, really tell where the destination is by the information column. So the info column, you see this number and then an arrow and then this number right here. So you have 49859 and then a narrow pointing to 7777. So that means source IP address at 192.168.1.3 at port 49859, which is my local, my, my Mac, to destination 192.168.1.8 to port 7777. The destination usually have some, usually will have some like commonly known number. So wait a minute, you may be asking yourself, what's port number 7777 for? I'm going to let you know this now. Port number 7777 is typically um, used for um, nefarious and interesting purposes. 
So really in this case is 7777 is the destination port number, the, destina uh, the destination port. Um, so the destination is 192.168.1.8 port 7777. Okay, so we just answered question number five. Also, do you, the bonus, a fun question, and remember we, uh, in my cybersecurity class, day two, which was on Tuesday, I mentioned something called the TCP three-way handshake. Do you see the TCP three-way handshake here? Take a look at the first three packets. This is how 192.168.1.3 is trying to talk to 192.168.1.8. They're trying to build a connection, a reliable connection, and you can see it from the first three packets. Take a look at the info column. It says info column. Uh, notice in the square bracket the flags. You have sync on uh, packet number one. Packet number two has sync act. And then packet number three has ACK acknowledgement act. These are the TCP flags. You see sync, sync act, act. And then some conversation happened. And then someone is going to end the call. F-I-N, Finn, goodbye. And these local IP addresses, they are engrave one they are. Because they are 190, they are local IP addresses. Um, this is local on my home network. So my home network uses 192.168.1. Very good question, yes. What are the bottom four packets after the data is sent on purpose? Yeah, um, good question. I always ask myself this, but it's like, what are the bottom four? The bottom four mean goodbye. After the, uh, yeah, it's like, goodbye, F-I-N. You see an F-I-N. Goodbye. Bin. Final. Close. Okay? Great question. But wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. You may be wondering here. I have eight packets here. I have eight network packets. Is there a way that now I have eight network packets, I have all these packets here in set1.pcap, can I reconstruct this conversation between 192.168.1.3 and 192.168.1.8? And the answer is yes. And this is why Wireshark is so powerful, such an important tool. This is how you reconstruct a conversation in Wireshark. How you reconstruct a conversation in Wireshark is the following. Click on a packet, any packet. It will be highlighted. Then you do a right click on the packet, you go to follow, and then you go to follow one of the following streams depending on protocol. TCP stream is the most common. So let's do it. So here I am again. Yeah, I'm gonna right click on, I don't care about this one. I'm gonna right click, follow, TCP stream. Sometimes you can get really specific ones like UDP stream, TLS stream, HTTP stream, so you can see all the web Traffic insecure, really, really cool. Everything is gonna be readable in plain text. If I follow TCP stream right now, watch what happens. What? Me worry. That's it, only one, that's it. That's a message that was sent from 192.168.1.3 to 192.168.1.8. The entire conversation is 15 bytes. You can show this data as ASCII. And if there were more than one file or content sent between the source and destination IP addresses, you would be able to change the stream. I can't click up and down on the stream. I can't. So there's nothing else other than what me worry. And you can also, what you can also choose to do is do a save as. You can actually export and save the conversation or the content onto your like desktop or something okay so let's do a fun one let's do a fun one right now so i'm actually now gonna close out of for set one that pcap let's do a real exercise let's do let's do this let's extract some pictures let's abstract extract pictures let's download i'm gonna make a copy of this link copy the link is this more or less how keyloggers work? Uh, keyloggers, yeah, I mean, keyloggers, think of it this way. It's, um, it's like a monkey. You know, more or less. I mean, Wireshark can be used for um, 
pry as quote unquote prying eyes. Key loggers are interesting because, you know, it's a physical device, but yeah, I mean, it, it really is like a prying eyes kind of a tool. Yeah, you can use Wireshark to capture USB. Yep, mm-hmm. So more or less. So I'm going to paste the link to set number two. Download it. Actually, I have a copy of set2.pcap on my computer. Set2.pcap is also very small, 390, well, 391 kilobytes. This one's a little more involved. How many packets are here? Oh, but, but first and foremost, make sure you clear out the filter. If there's anything, let's clear it out. Clear the display filter, it shows all, shows all the packet. So let's not have any filter available. All right. Set2.pcap. What is this thing? How many packets are here? What protocol? Well, how many packets are here? 482 packets. There's 482 packets here. But what's interesting about this one is I said the exercise is extract pictures. Really? There are pictures here? Yep. Question number one, what insecure protocol was used to transmit pictures on the network? And let's take a look. Let's take a look at the, um, let's take a look at the protocol. You have FTP, TCF, FTP-data, TCP, that's that. FTP, 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 FTP data. FTP dash data is actually the, the content, the pictures. FTP is a file transfer protocol. The file transfer protocol, the trans, uh, file transfer protocol uh, has been, it's been a very, it's not only a very popular and very famous protocol, it's a very old protocol, but it's also notoriously insecure because everything is sent in plain text. FTP, the trial file transfer protocol. File transfer protocol, very famous, very old. Also still used up to this day. But recently, very recently, hold on, hold on, I'm gonna to get to that after we like extract the pictures. How many pictures were transmitted? That's this question number two and extract one of the pictures, extract one of the pictures that was transmitted. The hint is to show and save that and save the picture as raw format. The file transfer protocol is notoriously insecure. But remember what we just did recently on the last exercise? What we want to do is click on any packet, follow TCP stream. That's what we're going to do. So that's what we're going to do. So that's what we just did. So now I have um, follow TCP stream, and I get this. Okay. Interesting is that you see a username and you see a password. Yeah. This is the username and password to the FTP server at 192.168.1.8. The shrieking shack. Login is successful. Switching to binary mode, let's see what we got. We got a JPEG here. I see a JPEG here. I see some text file. I see another JPEG, and I now see another JPEG. Yeah, I'll just paste the link again. There you go. But this time, remember what I said, if there were more than one file that was transmitted between point A and point B, you can up, you can actually click on the stream, see what happens. Ooh, here we go. Here we are in ASCII text. We have plain text. We got some data. Ooh, but this one is interesting. I see some, some interestingly readable stuff. I see JFIF. I see Photoshop 3.0, the RGB profile. This may look like a picture. Let's keep on scrolling up. I see another JFIF file. Ooh, I see a text file. Yep. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Copyright 2007 app. Mm hmm. Don't I know you from somewhere, that guy? 
I think I know you from somewhere. Now, this is a very long text file. The Cybersecurity at Real Politics by Dan Gere. This was Dan Gere's uh, keynote speech at Black Hat uh, Cybersecurity Conference 2014. How did you get there from seeing the stream? Uh, is this what you're asking for? What I did was, yeah, I just, here I am, no filter, follow TCP stream, and I just click on the different stream, like right here. You see stream? Now, this is stream zero, stream one. Yeah, it's actually uh, stream one. Actually, I see the 2000 copyright 2007 Apple. Stream two, stream three, this was a... Uh... Oh, <laughs> hey, I was... Going on, man. Good to see ya. Keynotes, this is our text file. By the way, I can do a save as on this. I can do a save as, and I can save this on my desktop as... What? How come I can't save it all of a sudden? Damn it. Keynote.txt. Can I be saved on my desktop? Yep, I can. Stream 4, Stream 5, Stream 6. All right, all right. All right, all right, but going back here. So we're going back to stream number zero. But stream number one, what does it mean that they're on different stream? Content. Different stream, think of it this way. That's a good question by Del Verino. By Del, Ver, by Del Verino, that's a good question. Different stream, think of it this way. Different file. What does it mean that they're on different stream? Each and every single file or content is on a different stream. I mean, if you have content, everything in one stream, it's going to be hard to break down. It's a really good question. So I also got that confused as well, too. By the way, is there any good document on that one? Oops. Uh, wait, that's a good question. Why is shark stream? What? Protocol stream. Uh, I'm not seeing anything good here. Did we all, did we open all of those packages when we followed uh, one of them to the stream? Hold on, hold on, hold on. That's a good question, too. I can't find the docs here. Eh? Yeah, connection, substream. Okay. Anyway. I can't find it, but that question, hold on for a second. Did we open all of these packets when we followed one of them to the stream? The answer is no, okay? Let me show you why. Let me show you why. The full set2.pcap at 482 packets. Full set two dot pcap had four hundred and eighty two packets, but if I do a follow TCP stream on the first one, this thing, it only takes up a certain number of packets, not all four hundred and something. You can see, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see the number difference now: one fifty six, one fifty seven, one fifty eight, one fifty nine, one sixty. 167, and then 259, 260, and then you can see the number the number gets chopped off. Are all of these streams contained in the original? Yes. That, CG underscore Happy Mac, are all of these streams contained in the original 482? Yes. No side channel traffic. Let's go, let me go to stream number one. Stream number one, the first picture of this first thing, Packet number 23, 24, 25, 28, 29, 30, and all the way up to 50. Stream number two, 
package number 57, 58, 59, 60, you get the idea now, to 156. Stream number 3, 163 to 258. Great question. A CG underscore happy match question, a very good one. All of these streams are in the original 482 packet. Really good question, yes. But now, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa. Let's do this. I want to go back to stream number one, this first Gobbledy Gook. What happened if we do a save as right now? We save this as something called output. One. Save it. No file extension. I'm going to open up my, car, my, my text editor. I'm going to open up. By the way, remember that keynote.txt that I saved out? There it is. That's the entire text of Dan Gare's Black Hat 2014 keynote speech. But I also want to open up output number one. There you go. Here's your first picture. Congratulations. We just save it. Oh, wait a minute. Wait, but this is like in binary data. Wait, this is all in ASCII text. I thought this was supposed to be a picture. It is going to be a picture. But the problem is, I didn't save it as a picture. I saved it as ASCII text. I'm going to open up the terminal again. I'm going to do file output one. So to determine what kind of a file type this is, there's no file extension in output one. But if I do a file, it's, it's ASCII text with very long lines. Not a picture. Now to save, make sure that to see if this is really, really a picture. Instead, what I do is show the data as save the data. Show data as raw. Entire conversation of sixteen kilobyte. I'm gonna now save as, and I'm gonna also. I'm just gonna overwrite output one. I'm gonna hit save. Output one is this. You wanna replace it? Yeah, I wanna replace it. Now. You ready, that guy, 43848? You ready, that guy, 4348? You ready? Looks different. This time around, do this file, because now I say I, I, I outputted, I exported the content as raw, not, not ASCII text. You can see output is JPEG image data. Now, uh, what I, one thing I can do is I can do a cheap trick. I can do, I can rename output one. I can rename this output one.jpg. That's what happened. Boom. There you go. You go ahead. That's output number one. Let's do it again. Let's go to stream number two. This looks like something else. Save this as uh, show data as raw. Save as output two. File output two. JPEG. I'm going to actually rename output two. Uh, output two dot JPEG. Boom. You can, you can see the desktop changing, right? There it is. Delete cookie. All right. Oop. Wait a minute. What the hell? I thought I had the windows here. What? Oh, here it is. I'm going to have ASCII text. I'm going to go to stream three. We already saved this one. I mean, this is ASCII text itself. Now, what's this one? I'll put four. Uh, instead of asking, I'm going to show the wrong. There. There. Oh, I'll, I'll put three. Oh. Ugh. I'll put four. I'm going to rename output four. Okay, I'll put three. Got JPEG. Really, is output four. I mean, I'm not wrong. Output four. So we have we've got the keynote, the output one, output two, output four. Get message. One more. There should be one more, right? 
One more. Yeah. Show it raw. Save it. I'll put five. I mean, there should be nothing left, right? Nah, nothing left. Maybe two peg. And the final picture, algorithm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm also fascinated myself. A stream, oh, what's a stream? Stream is just, uh, think of it this way, the content, the picture, the text file, whatever it is. That's what a stream is. All right, so now let's do one more exercise. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Oh, no moment to pull for four. So we just uh, did this. We just extracted a whole bunch of pictures from set exercise two. Exercise two, extract a bunch of pictures. We just did this. Let's do one more. Extracting a, a file content. This time gets really interesting. Now, this is a big file. Uh, let's do exercise number three. I'm going to copy the link to this one. This one is a little... Be careful about this one, though. Copy the link. Okay. Hey, Caleb. How are you? I can see Letty. Sorry. How does a file command figure out the format? That's a good question. Wait, hold on, hold on. So, C Lady Zero One's uh, 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 question is a really good one. Hey, that guy, four three four eight. Does the man page says it? I'm gonna try it myself. Did the man page actually man file? Let's see. How, let's let's answer. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah, it does. File tests each other. There are three sets of tests performed in this order. File system and magic test, head scratcher, and language test. The first test has to see if cause the file type to be printed. Yeah, so it is kind of brute force. Hell, I didn't even know this until now. Thank you so much, by the way, folks. I learn something new every day. I honestly didn't know this. I didn't know this. Yeah, so C Lady zero, uh, zero 01's question is a good one. I didn't know it either. All right, set three dot pcap a little bit more involved, a little bit more involved, or maybe this is a media file now. Open the set three dot pcap in Wireshark. What protocol was used to transfer a media file? The typical what's the IP address of this client and the server? What port number on the server did the client send the media file to? Question number five is reconstruct and play the media file. What kind of media file is it? Bonus question is, how do you think the media file was transferred from client to server, i.e. what tool was tool? <laughs> Just a couple of packets. <laughs> Let's take a look. Set 3. Ooh, set 3. PCAP is 38.38, 39 megabytes. So it's a big one. Clear the filter. Scroll all the way down. Now this time we got 38,469 packets. Mm. Yeah, just a couple of them. But it shouldn't scare you. It, no, 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 it shouldn't scare you at all. 38,469. What's interesting about this packet is there's only, two, there's only two IP addresses involved. There's only a source and a destination in this one. I filtered it out when I designed this set3.pcap. Set3.pcap only has a source at 192.168.1.228. And the destination is at 192.168.1.20. Now, the port number that's being used, uh, the source, the client is 192.168.1.228, and the destination is 192.168.1.20. The protocol that's being used is TCP. It's nothing fancy. It's, um, oh, one thing that's important is a lot of the stuff that we use all the time, um, H, like HTTP, HTTPS, FTP, they all work on top of TCP. So FTP, HTTP, or all uh, uh, things like IMAP for email, it's all TCP. You can see the sync, sync, ack, and ack here. Port number is 7777. Uh, we see the four, uh, the four sevens again. But this time, but this time, let's do the same thing that we have been doing. Right-click, 
follow TCP stream. That's all we need to do. But you got to be patient this time because there's a lot of packets. Now you see right here that this number is still going. Let it go. Don't do a damn thing until it stops. So the entire conversation is 37 megabytes. I find the numbers finally stop at 31,582 client packets. Now this is all ASCII format. I can't see it. I can't understand a damn thing. Ooh, but the end gets interesting. I see quick time. Hmm. All right, let's do what we have been doing before. Instead of ASCII, let's go to raw. Let's change this to raw. Oh, metadata. The bottom. iPhone 7 Plus. Mm. Date uh, 2019-8-8. Let's really see what the hell this thing is. Show the data as raw and also don't do a damn thing until this number stops. So it should be like the 30-something thousand again. But I haven't, okay, finally for me it finished. But this time I'm going to do a save as, I'm going to save this as movie. I'm going to save this to my desktop as something called movie. That's it. Or media, I should have saved it as media. But this time... Remember I said movie? Let's run the file command on movie. Here it is. Here's a movie. It's on my desktop right here. File movie. Aha. Uh -huh. It's a dot .mov. Apple QuickTime movie. I'm going to move movie. I'm just going to add a dot .mov extension to it. Ready? Watch what happens on my on, on, on my desktop. When I rename movie to movie.mov, get a movie. I'm now gonna open this with I can open it with VLC as right default, or I can open it as QuickTime Player. Let's let's open it up with QuickTime Player. So I'm gonna play it. Does it work on non yeah, it should work. If you you know the best thing is if you ever want to play any type of media file. I don't care whether you're on Windows, Mac, or Linux, use VLC. Best media player, like, and open source as well, too. Do you, if you use the open command, does it open? Yeah, let's see. Open movie.mov. Let's see. Yeah, I, I set everything to... that again file extensions are important for any operating system but different system interpret stuff differently it depends on if you had the codex uh, installed so about that movie that I just played um, that was from 2019 uh, that was the last time I was in Vegas uh, for DEF CON. Um, so we crashed the party. Uh, Jen Ellis of Rapid7, probably still not happy. I think we've, we, everything's all forgiven now. So we crashed the party at the uh, dueling piano bar at the Paris Hotel and Casino. Uh, we crashed the party. And um, where I was meeting up with uh, a friend for a drink back then, um, Josh Abraham. And we hung around, we drank for a bit, and then we called another buddy of ours, uh, Peter Keenan, and he's and uh, we was like, I don't know if you can make it, but if you want to join us, like, oh yeah, I'm actually here, yeah, like actually, like not too far, I'll just come right away, give me like 30, uh, 20, uh, 10 to 10 to 20 minutes, and sure enough, he showed up, and um, yeah, we hung around and chat and chat, uh, 
one of my fondest, always one of my fondest memories, and that was, um, that video was from, from that, that evening. So much fun. And, uh, want to give a shout out to Josh, want to give a shout out to, uh, to Peter. Always a pleasure. Yeah, so that's how you recreate the movie. Let's do one more, the most nefarious example of them all. I don't think I need this anymore. Let's do one more. We'll call it a day. But before we do the one last PCAP exercise, let's, we'll talk about this thing called Base64. Base64 is an encoding scheme, not an encryption scheme. What Base64 is, is used to represent binary data in ASCII text format. Now, why is this important? Actually, I do need the terminal again. Remember earlier on, okay, I did cat set one dot pcap. And then now you can hear my terminal going, like making funny noises and beeps and all that stuff. Well, look, outputting binary data to a terminal sometimes may not be safe. Like if I do cat set two dot pcap, and, uh, if I do, you know, uh, you know, because sometimes outputting binary data to a terminal may not be safe because of the thing like beeping and all that other fun stuff. So that's, it would be a lot nicer and a lot safer if the binary data here was in ASCII text, where everything was in ASCII text. So that's what Base64 is. Base64 is used to translate binary data into a safer format like ASCII text. Base64 is not encryption. Base64 is not encryption. It's not encryption. It's not encryption. It's not encryption. But unfortunately, it kind of is used for encryption when it comes to basic, something called basic HTTP authentication. So basic HTTP authentication, what that is, is I'm sure you've all seen like websites that have this. I'll just do a, I'll just do a, a search for it. Oh, come on. Yeah, have you ever seen websites that look like this? It says Authent authentication required, enter in your username and your password. Yeah, the terminal sometimes can't interpret it as something it should run, like scripts. Yep, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. That's a great question by Del Verino. Now, the problem is, is when you send a username and password in basic uh, authentication required, like a, like a pop-up window like this, the problem is your password, a username and password are not encrypted. They are just encoded in, base six, in this thing called Base64. Your username and your password, they get concatenated with a semicolon and it just get base 64. It's even worse if you send it over HTTP because HTTP, everything is in plain text. So there's no security absolutely at all. So here's the key. A request comes from the header field authorized in the form. The string that you want to look for is authorization colon space basic. I want to make a, make a note of this. Uh, authorization colon space basic and then followed by your credentials where the credentials is a base 64 encoding of the ID the username and the password joined by a colon yeah run the penguin yeah you're gonna see base 64 not only throughout this course it is extremely important in malware analysis or malware creation malware creation too Let's do one more exercise. Let's find username and password pair, shall we? Copy the link. S open up to set four in uh, Wireshark. What protocol was used to transmit the credential username and password pair uh, credentials? What is one username and password pair in a PCAP set? And last but not least, would this username and password pair make the wall a sheep? Is it valid or not? Why or why not? Go to Wireshark now. And I'm going to open up set4.pcap. Clear the any filters. Now, set4.pcap. Set4.pcap. 
How many packets are here? 170 packets only. Now, we can do a bunch of things. We can do a few things here. We can try, like, right-click on something and follow TCP stream. Or if you actually can click on an H, you can also find HTTP. HTTP is a really specific version. It is really specific. So if you click on a highlight HTTP, you're going to do a follow HTTP stream. Now here it is. Here we go. Remember, aha, uh aha, -huh, aha, uh aha, -huh, uh aha, -huh, uh -huh, I found something. Remember this thing called uh, basic authentication, uh, basic authorization. I told you what we need to, the string that you need to look for is authorization colon space basic. And then the string after this is something called a base64 encoded string. I'm going to make a copy of this encoded string. And now I'm actually getting, like using Google, I can do base64 decode. I'm going to look for base64 decoder. Base64decode.org. Let's take a look at what this is. I'm going to paste, I'm going to do a decode. I'm going to paste the string here and I'm going to hit decode. Watch what happens. B. Ro B Rogers colon, they played with great character as the decoded version of that base64 encoded string. That is a username and password, username colon password that was entered. Hold up, we're not done. But here's the problem though. I did get a 401, 401 authorization required, and then if you read the error message correctly, this server could not verify that you are authorized to access the document requested. Either you supplied the wrong credential, uh, e.g. bad password, so the username and password, in this case, B. Rogers, is incorrect. So it didn't work at all. Okay? It didn't work at all. So this username and password that we just, oh, also what's nice is that in Wireshark, Wireshark is nice enough, they're really kind enough to actually, if I'm not mistaken, they should be able to decode um, I thought they did. Line-based text. I thought they could. I mean, I've, I've seen it before. That it was able to de... Wireshark sometime can actually just do a base 64 decode of the thing for you. Actually, let me just go click on that uh, HTTP packet. But this time, instead of following HTTP stream, I'll just follow TCP stream. Yep, they did. Here we go. I can actually click on, yep, there is a field authorization column basic. And then if I actually, credentials. B. Rogers, they played with great characters. Aha. So Wireshark does actually can um, decode base64 uh, credentials. I don't think that's the only one here, though. Let's do another search. So let's this time I want to do a string search. Narrow and wide. Packet detail, authorization, colon, space, basic, and a string search. Here we go. Found another one. Another credential. Authorization, colon, space, basic, Z, yada, yada, yada. Credentials, D. Moyes, colon, I am a football genius. There we go. Let's find again. Is there another one? Yep. Found another one. Authorization, colon, basic. This is a base64 encoded string. Credential, A. Ausler, ID10T expert. I want to give a shout out to this is Ann Ausler. Ann Ausler is a former student from the class of 2016, Comp 1 CS116, my security class. And she worked on Internet of Things for so long, and she absolutely had a bone to pick with Internet of Things. She was well ahead of her time. Wherever you are, Ann, hello. Okay. So, is there anything else? I think we're done. I think we're over time by five minutes. I am I apologize for that. I mean, it's just a lot of fun doing this. Good to be back. So, we have five, five credentials. Can we find again? Yeah, we're back at B. Rogers. So, there are three credentials here. Sent in plain text. Sent in base 64. All three did not work. So, now, like, where do you go from here is, well, there's lots of opportunities. Um, 
there's a whole, like, you know, there's a lot of packets that you can download on the web. The next thing is, you know, sniff and validate password, you know, download PCAPs on the internet, reconstruct files. Volunteer to pack wall of sheep in the packet hacking village at DEFCON when it comes back when it's back in person. Um, we also have uh, packet inspector and packet detective events, which are to hone your skills. And we also have a house of a black badge uh, contest to capture the packet where it is lifetime emission to DEFCON. That's that for oh, folks. Yep, there's an appendix on T Shark here. Yeah. All right, it's been a lot of fun. Next class, yeah. Uh, in the future, uh, future class is going to be taught on OSX or Kali VM. Uh, future classes is a uh, funny thing is a good question. I actually am on an M1 uh, Mac, so I'm only going to be on a Mac. Uh, I can't run virtual machines on a M1 or Apple Silicon machine. How many ways are there to intercept packets? Uh, more than three I can name off the top of my head. Using a rubber ducky, uh, art poisoning, like poison a, a router. Or the other one is just run things like DSNF and it'll just do the job for you. That is all for today. That is all. Uh, it is great to be back. Next week, we're going to do network reconnaissance and a network mapper. And map. Yeah, we're going to do network mapper next class. So the one-two punch. Very important security tool. See you all next week, 430. What a pleasure. Good to be back. Great to be back. Thank you all. Thank you all. Mm. Fun one today. Awesome. Stop the recording. Uh, yes, this will also be uh, exported to YouTube uh, after that. See you next week.